Pantheistica by John Toland of the Ancient and Modern Societies of the Learned, sections 10 to 13. From this coincidence of extremes, the pantheists deduce a certain third and truly wonderful motion of the earth, which is to be measured by the progress of the equinoctial points, the fixed showing it to a demonstration, and therefore by the flow with continued declination of the meridian line. The axis of the earth, I say, rolls without season, always parallel to itself, about the pole of the ecliptic, from which it is distant in every place 23 degrees and a half, inclining to the plane of the ecliptic, and the equinoxes by the feet precede the southern parts, having nothing to do with the ecliptic. Than this, there cannot be a clearer demonstration founded upon the observations of Aristarchus, Eudoxus, Hipparchus, Ptolemy, Copernicus, Halley, and other excellent ancient and modern astronomers, so that, when the equinoxes come to the Tropic of Capricorn, there's a necessity of their proceeding farther to the Antarctic Pole, and so, afterwards, by turning about to the Arctic. We Britons, in reality, are more remote now from the Arctic Pole than in the time of Pythias the Basilian, although the eighth sphere is at so great a distance from the Earth that the diversities, magnitudes, and oppositions of the celestial appearances described by ancient astronomers seem not so much changed in the senses throughout the course of 2,000 years and upwards, but that we have an effect come nearer to the Antarctic Pole, not only the seasons of the year, by little and little altered by the progress of the equinoxes, are a testimony, but also a milder temperateness of the same seasons proceeding from hence, which evidently appears from history and the authority of observations. This third motion, which I call equinoctial, to distinguish it from the diurnal and annual motion of the earth, proceeding gradually from east to west, brings matters so to pass that the sphere, called the eighth, or the region of visible fixed stars, though immovable, might seem, nevertheless, to go from west to east, so that, whether the eighth sphere moves over the poles of the ecliptic in consequentia, or whether there is a progress of the equinoxes in the Edentia, the appearances will be the same, and all the same things will be at our sight. This phenomenon should be explained in the same way as the other motions of the Earth, formerly attributed to the Sun and planets, and it must be rescued from the absurdities of predating cavillers, both which we have sufficiently acquitted ourselves of in the third book of Esoterics. As a natural consequence of this equinoctial motion, every particle of our globe, the same may be said of the other planets, must, in the course of ages, undergo all sorts of adventures and vicissitudes. This inclination of the meridian, says every pantheist, shows that the axis of the earth does not always pass through opposite parts. Whence it comes to pass that by little and little, and insensibly different and different regions are placed under the axis, and the inhabitants of the zone, now frigid, are brought back and turned to the equinoctial line. And, at length, the place of the Arctic Pole to the Antarctic, and the east to the west, which Herodotus, from the sacred authority and mysterious monuments of the Egyptian priests, testifies to have happened formerly twice. That is, the sun sets where it now rises, and rises as often where it now sets. This not only twice, but also innumerable times has happened, and will happen in the eternal duration of things, although such a conversion of the stars and a reduction of all parts into the same situation requires a revolution of about 36,000 years. Copernicus, it seems, would fain reduce this number to 25,000 years. Oh, how often those have been made a jest of who ridicule